Distinctive, exceptional, unusual, uncommon, peculiar, extraordinary, different. That's how the dictionary defines the word special. The same words aptly describe Northwestern University's Charles Deering McCormick Library of Special Collections, home to a 9th century manuscript, 20th century sci-fi and comic book collections, valuable works of art, 3,500-year-old Mesopotamian clay tablets, and even a fishing rod. Housed in a Gothic structure reminiscent of Harry Potter's Hogwarts, Northwestern's Deering Library is more than a shrine for books. Its treasures include everything from clay tablets. The outer part is essentially an envelope. To comic books. And this is the first issue of The Amazing Spider-Man. And for students and scholars who use Northwestern Special Collections Library, the greatest value of this vast collection may be its accessibility. The materials are here to be used and appreciated and not simply locked up. We want people to come here. We want people to know that if they want to look at the Mesopotamian clay tablets, they can. They don't have to feel that there are things that can only be used by uh, scholars or by professors researching something or looking at materials under glass, so to speak, and not being able to touch them and handle them. Most people are, are very careful and they respect respect that. The library's collection of photographs taken at the World's Columbian Exhibition hosted in Chicago in 1893 are valuable teaching tools for Professor Carl Smith, who specializes in 19th century and early 20th century cultural history. There's just no substitute for working with the actual documents. Until you see these very well done, these very finely detailed things, you just don't have a real sense of being there in quite the same way that these photographs can provide. They're beautiful in themselves and they are documentary in a way that they take us there and show us what it was actually like in a way that no, no, uh, no verbal description can possibly do. And they literally take your breath away. I have students that come in and they talk about it, they look at the fair and then they see these pictures and they go, wow. In fact, wow is a word heard often here, with more than 225,000 of the most unusual, unique, and valuable items on campus. There is something for everyone. A treasure can be a tiny slip of paper with a scribble on it. A treasure can be something in a jeweled binding. Uh, treasure is almost entirely subjective. I mean, there's some agreed-upon cultural iconic items that, of course, everybody's going to say, oh, it has to be in special collections. Um, and then there are things that, to other people, they'll be like, oh, why do you have this? Some of the items are contemporary, some ancient. The definition of old keeps changing. I think of old when it's maybe before 1700, but some people think of it as old when it's before 1960. People are in awe that we have like things from the 1960s sometimes. Kids coming in, oh, like, oh wow, you have these hippie things. And then the oh wows continue. You have like Mesopotamian clay tablets. You have books of hours with hand-painted illuminations. Library assistant Sigrid Perry discovered a 9th century Carolingian manuscript during a routine search in the library stacks. When I saw this binding on this book, uh, the faculty member had requested the book and it hadn't been looked at for a long time. I realized the binding had to be at least 12th century. The richly inscribed vellum manuscript was sent to three medieval experts. And they each came back uh, after analyzing it, saying it was 9th century. So it's really the earliest example of something that we have. Whether centuries old or relatively new, each item opens a window in time. D.H. Lawrence recorded a list of friends who sent him checks to pay for copies of his newly self-published and controversial novel, Lady Chatterley's Lover. Some of the subscribers are quite famous people. Alfred Stieglitz, the photographer, is listed here. Aldous Huxley. This anti-Nazi propaganda was distributed in Germany during World War II. This one, it looks like it uh, is instructions for a camera. But when you open it up inside, there's a letter to the German people about uh, anti-fascism and about what's going on with the war and how they should not support Hitler. A bank's uh, brochure about the city of Dusseldorf 
And again, inside, we find another anti-fascist document. We have a huge collection of material relating to the siege and commune of Paris. So these are scenes of some of the destruction that occurred during the bombing when the Prussians invaded, and also scenes of Paris before the destruction. We now have thousands of images uh, relating to this, and it's one of the earliest wars documented by photography. I think people are surprised that we have a huge collection of comic books, perhaps because we're a university research library. Comic books are thought of as not intellectual, not research worthy, which is erroneous in many ways. I mean, comic books are an art form. They're sort of a minefield of social data about the times they are created, social mores, even superheroes and what they represent to different generations of people. Some of the social data is still locked inside obsolete technology to be discovered by future generations. In one archive here, we receive these old paper computer ribbon tapes. We have no machinery to play this on. We have no idea what's on here. Um, it's dead media. And so we're trying to prevent that kind of orphaning as best as we can. Northwestern's Charles Deering McCormick Library of Special Collections includes the work of many eccentric artists and performers. This is a little painting produced in Austria, and it's a painting done on cobwebs. The spider webs are woven and then uh, solidified with milk, sort of soaked in milk to make them stronger, and then watercolor would be applied to them. These are moths and butterflies of the United States. The author personally transferred scales from real butterflies onto these illustrations, and he did thousands of these. So how did the special collections end up with such an eclectic mix? It happened over time. Many of the items were donated. Others were purchased. One strategy of collection building is, if you think of that as sort of a, a grain of sand, you're forming a growing of pearl around it. You use a nucleus collection like that to generate further acquisitions. Because you want scholars to be able to have a condensed, extensive collection of material in one location. Now, I don't know what's going to be exactly in any of these given boxes. When we bought this from the dealer, we received an excellent description of it, but not an itemized level description. A recent acquisition, purchased from a British book dealer, is the archive of the Garnets, a family closely associated with Bloomsbury, the literary circle that included Virginia Woolf and Vanessa Bell. 200 years of history centered around one family. What a field day for scholars. Scholars like Professor of English, Christine Frohla. The archive is important because it has a lot of correspondence and a lot of manuscripts, a lot of material that creates a kind of cross-section of a family of letters Our through time. For some visiting child. But yeah, that gate still exists as it's seen here. Northwestern University's Library of Special Collections, preserving cultural history for scholars, students, and future generations. I think it's just a delightful thing to not only know we have them here, but to actually be able to hold them and see them is, I think, wonderful and wonderful connection to the past. Things that, uh, that we take for granted and put in the wastebasket the next day will speak of this day if they're preserved.